Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My Karen neighbor won't stop cutting my grass. After that, guy tips big to impress date, but returns later to take his money back. And after that, Entitled Kid wants free pizza forever, gets banned instead. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to mow anyone's lawn. But it's so fun! So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen neighbor won't stop cutting my grass. I know the title sounds bad because she's technically doing me a favor, but hear me out. I work third shift and oftentimes get home at 5 or 6 a.m., but can't fall asleep until about 10 a.m. most days. I'm a very light sleeper and I live in a trailer, so my walls are extremely thin. I don't get mad about my other neighbor cutting their lawn. While it is annoying to listen to, it's their lawn and I don't control them. However, I've explained to her twice now about my job and how I sleep, and this is the third time she has started mowing my lawn. I told her explicitly that she didn't have to do it anymore and that I would truthfully rather her not. Leave my own house chores to me. I am a grown woman. She seemed to understand. As I write this, she's mowing my lawn. It's 11.30 a.m. I understand this is a normal time to mow lawns, but this is my property. I should also note that she uses my mower and my weed whacker for this, but doesn't often replace the gas in the mower or forgets to plug in the battery for the whacker. I have a plug in my shed specifically for this. I would go confront her again, but that would be the third time and I'm honestly considering just beginning to lock my shed and at my gate. I've never had a problem with her before, other than the fact that she <clears throat> lacks a lot of common sense, and I have to explain things to her often despite her being well into her 50s. I'm not going to the park manager because I don't think it's that big of a deal, but kind of feel bad that I'm angry with her for doing something that benefits me more than it doesn't. Am I the jerk? Edit. The reason I don't want to lock the gate and shed is because our other neighbor, an elderly lady, comes and borrows our tools occasionally for her garden. I'm going to be locking it anyway before I leave for work today and go back to explain to aforementioned older lady that she can use my tools, but I'm hiding the key in an area close to the shed, and that's where the key will be from now on. I have a spare inside. Edit 2. I've taken advice from a few people and I'm going to get a copy of the shed key made for my older elderly neighbor and let her know the situation but be clear that I don't want her to take action. She is the park manager. I'm not going to be hiding my key, just keeping it inside, because she is observant and will probably find where I hide it without realizing it's hidden, slash, from her. All in all, thank you to everybody who provided actual constructive replies and helped me figure out my situation. Here's to hoping next week I won't wake up at 11.30 a.m. to weed whackers outside my window. Cheers. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you try to get Karen to stop cutting your lawn or not? Please let us know. Nothing better than a riding lawnmower and a monster energy on a Saturday afternoon. Guy tips big to impress his date, but returns later to take back his money. We had a guy come in last night with his date. Throughout the evening, he was the pitcher of courtesy and good manners. He complimented me, thanked me every time I came to refresh his water or check on the table, made a point to be forgiving of a kitchen mistake super extra nice. The dream customer, really. I appreciated it, but didn't delude myself that I was the source and figured he was just in a good mood because the date was going well. They were chatting, laughing, and having a great time, so I assumed I was an indirect beneficiary. He was certainly in some kind of celebratory mood because he was sparing no expense. He asked for our highest quality wine. She got our most expensive entree, he ordered one of every appetizer for her to sample when she made a remark that she was having trouble deciding. It was a real feast. So the evening starts wrapping up and I get their check. I ask if they'll be together or separate. She starts to say separate, but he makes a big deal of saying, Oh, are you kidding? Together. Definitely together. You never have to pay when you're with me, babe. And so on and so forth. Then slides me a credit card. I get everything sorted and bring out the receipt. He fills it out and it came to a $289 total. He doesn't even blink and makes a big show of leaving a $100 tip. He thanks me for my service and emphasizes what a lovely night they had. Of course, 
a tip that size is exceptional, so I thanked him profusely. He said there was no need to thank him and goes on a big tear about how underappreciated waitstaff are and to just think of it as a stand-in for all of the ingrates who didn't treat me right, going, don't plan to tip, don't plan to eat out, you know? Looking at the mesmerized girl the whole time and not giving me a glance. I could care less where he was looking, I was looking at the upcoming hundred bucks. I thanked him again and said I hoped to see them back soon and that was that. So he helps her into her coat and off they go. Great night, I was riding high. About 90 seconds later, he's back in the door without her, going, I think I left my... Then when the door shut and looking to make sure she was out of earshot, he goes, without the slightest shade of shame or embarrassment, Mark the tip down to 20 bucks, hun. I was just playing it up for my date. You understand? And turns to go. Uh, I understand, but not how he hoped I would. But I couldn't make a scene in the middle of work. That's not my place. So I just said one more time in order to give his conscience a chance to sink in. Okay, sir. You'd like me to amend your tip from $100 to $20? Is that correct? And even though I didn't show a hint of displeasure in my voice, he shot back, extremely hostile. Yes, and if I see a cent over the 20 on there, I'm going to dispute the whole meal with my credit vendor. So, don't try to pull anything. The most frustrating part of this for me was not even going from an over 30% tip to under 10%, but rather that this poor girl was being strung along with no idea of who the guy was behind her back. It was extremely manipulative of him, which is a major red flag. I've had my fair share of toxic relationships in the past and really wish someone had pulled the blinders off my eyes, so desperately wanted to do something to alert this girl to the trick the guy had pulled, hoping it would be a catalyst to her questioning his other actions. But again, I was at work, and that just wasn't my place, so I altered the bill and that was that. Then, just in time, something occurred to me and I darted outside hoping to catch them in the parking lot. I got lucky. They had parked on the street instead and he was still dealing with the parking meter. So I flagged him down and rushed across the street, nearly stumbling into traffic in my haste for a delicious moment. His date was already in the car but rolled down her window, since no one expects the waitress to follow you out to your car, waving her arms like a crazy person. I made it across and said, more than loudly enough for her to hear me, Sir, we amended your tip from $100 down to $20 as you requested but you'll actually need to fill out a different receipt reflecting your new total for our records. Your old receipt still has your original tip of $100 written on it, but since you just came in and asked us to charge you $20 instead, we can't have a discrepancy in our records. I hope you understand. This is just a bookkeeping regulation that goes way above me. It has nothing to do with your retroactively downgrading your tip from $20 to $100. We're just glad you enjoyed your evening. His jaw was on the floor. He tried to pretend as though he didn't know what I was talking about, trying to give me some line about, I think you're after someone else. I had only come back in because I forgot my keys. But I would not let it rest. The more he played dumb, the more I repeated versions of, you wanted to change your tip from 100 down to 20. You came back in, and on and on. So we went back and forth for a few more seconds when finally he went, Okay, whatever. Uh, sorry for the miscommunication. If you need me to fill out a new receipt, I can. And I, totally even killed, was like, you only need to fill out a new receipt if you want to change your tip from $100 down to 20. And I'm guessing he didn't have the money in his account because he did it. He filled out the new receipt, his girlfriend was visibly shocked, and the man was staring daggers through me. You could feel the rage emanating off him. It was vicariously quite satisfying in place of the other toxic people I never get get that confrontation with and all the bad tippers. Ironically, the exact kind he made a righteous speech decrying just a few minutes beforehand. And then off they drove. I'm sure never to patronize our restaurant again, but hopefully never to go out together again either, which would make it totally worth it. Entitled Kid Wants Free Pizza Forever Gets Banned Instead. Cast. We've got the manager, we've got me, we've got nice employee, May, and we've got Karen, the ever-entitled, entitled bomb. So I'm a store manager for a large chain pizza place that charges a bit more than the competition but makes an arguably better product. We try to always believe the customer and make them happy if something is wrong. 
We have a loyal base of regulars who order often as well as a lot of other business from randoms in the several nearby hotels. Friday night, Entitled Karen calls in an order, very simple pep and jalapeno pizza. Driver delivers it. 30 minutes later, I'm asked to talk to an angry customer on the phone. Karen, is this the manager? I've been on hold for over half an hour. Impossible, but okay. Me, I'm very sorry about that, ma'am. What seems to be the problem? Karen, I'm at the hotel and your driver was so rude and my pizza is burnt. Me, Sorry to hear that the pizza was not up to our quality standards. Can I make you another and send it out? No, don't bother. You have already ruined my kids' dinner and they are crying now. Give me credit. Red flag. Me. Okay, ma'am. I'll credit your number and when you order next time, it will be free. I'm very sorry again. Have a good night. Whatever. She hangs up. I credit the number and think whatever. That's the end of it. Saturday night. Hey, this lady on the phone wants to speak to a manager. Me. Hello, thank you for holding. This is me. Are you all stupid? How long does it take to answer the darn phone? Me. I'm sorry, what? We've only been on hold for a moment while my employee got me. Don't tell me how long I've been on hold. I know how long I've been on hold for. I'm groaning inwardly already. A fun customer. Yippee. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. How can I assist you? My pizza is burnt, and you have the rudest delivery driver ever. They practically threw the pizza in my face. Light bulb clicks at this story. I've dealt with this lady before. Me. I'm sorry to hear that. I'll definitely talk to the driver about it. Can I make you a new pizza to replace the one you said is burnt? No. Give me a credit. Me. Okay, ma'am. To ensure our quality standards are being met, can I have a driver come pick up the burnt pizza so I can talk to my production staff about it? No, we ate it. Me, you ate the burnt pizza? Yes, we were starving and couldn't wait for a remake. So give me a credit. Me, for the pizza you ate? It was burnt. Let me speak to a manager. Me, I am the manager. I want to speak to your manager. You are being so rude and disrespectful. You don't know who I am, but you're about to find out. She then hangs up before I can say anything else. Being as she was extra, I let my DM know about a possible complaint on my behavior and what actually went down. Just as I get off the phone with her, I hear yelling in the lobby. Karen, where is that jerk manager? I step around the partition and see this Karen wearing tacky bright green and orange with red shoes. Me, can I help you? I'm already done with this jerk because I know who she is. Karen, gonna say something now? Give me my refund for the burnt pizza, and I want gas money for driving over here. Me. You didn't pay for any pizza. It was free. We don't reimburse gas for people driving to the store. You think this is a joke? You're going to give me my money, or it's gonna go off in this place. I'm 100% done at this point. Me. Get out. Karen. What did you say? Get out of the store. You can't tell me to leave. This is a public place. No, ma'am. It's a private business, and you are no longer allowed here. I'm refusing to serve you. Leave now, or I'll be forced to call the police. Forget you. She continues to bellow this until the police arrive. I had to hear every sing-song version of Forget You for about five minutes. Police, do you want to trespass her? Me. Yes, she isn't welcome here anymore. Police in our town are super cool with us because we give them special discounts and occasionally donate a stack of pizzas to the precinct. Police just outside main door easily heard. Okay, so you are now being trespassed. Do not come here, do not linger in the parking lot, or you will be arrested. This applies for every single pizza store, not just this one. The defeated look on her face when he said that was almost worth the cost of admission. Not the most epic ending, I know, but what can you do? Speaking of pizza, what's your favorite place to get pizza from? Please let us know. I could really go for some Papa John's right now. Mm, that butter sauce, yes. You're working 20 minutes more every day? Unacceptable. In the early 2000s, I was living in the commuter belt and working in central London. For those not familiar, London only has one train line running through it from north to south. The rest of the lines terminate at somewhere on the circle line of the underground, roughly. For your average commuter, 
That means your local train will go between one and four stations, and so you'll favor jobs on your side of the city to save getting a bus or tube, but for many it involves one or two of them too. For me, I only had one destination from my local station, which was a tiny, slow trains only one, and it wasn't the station right across the road from my office. To get there, I would have to make a change. This added to the journey time just enough that I was five minutes late to work every day. However, I've lied to you. There was only one and only one train a day that went to the station I wanted, but it left an hour earlier and got me in an hour and 20 minutes earlier. There was also a single train back in the evening 30 minutes after I clocked off, so my daily routine was to get the train with a change in the morning arriving 5 minutes late and in the evening I'd work 25 minutes extra and get the direct train home. With the station being so close, I was fine to leave it that close to the wire. I usually got a seat, even cutting it, so fine, all was good, for about 18 months. For some reason I do not understand, maybe it was my fighting with the guy who kept assigning me work, even though he wasn't my boss. My actual boss relayed that his boss, the head of IT, was unhappy with me constantly being late. I was young, I was naive. I thought they'd understand that I was working a net plus 20 minutes every day. My boss was actually very cool and didn't want to be dealing with this, but his boss was making a stink. So he explained to his boss and the reply came back that I must be in on time because those are your contracted hours. I was young and naive, but that doesn't mean I was a pedantic little jerk. I proceeded to get the early train, losing an hour sleep each morning and arriving at the office an hour and 20 minutes early, took my shoes off, put them up on my desk, set an alarm, and did my best to claw back that lost sleep. As people trickled into the office, I refused to work or even answer a phone until I was within my contracted hours. Come clocking off time, I would pack up and leave to go stand at the platform for nearly 25 minutes, staring off into the distance, thinking about all of the work they are losing from me. This lasted about a week before I was told I can't sleep at my desk, so I found the smallest break room that had a sofa and made that my nap spot. It wasn't comfortable, but I was upset at how strict they were being. Of course, I carried on going home when my contracted hours were up. A few weeks later, my chance came. The crap had hit the fan and they needed me to work late. As I said before, my immediate boss was cool and I had a, I know you know what I'm really saying when I say this, conversation with him about how this was outside my contracted hours. But I understand that there is a give and take and that when it's needed or it doesn't cause an issue. Give and take, right? After that evening, I started showing up five minutes late again and nothing was said about it again. I also started staying right up until my train was due, sometimes. Edit. To say that I didn't get paid overtime unless it was approved beforehand, like the day it hit the fan, I just worked the extra to finish up what I was doing. And because I was young and dumb enough to think hard work got you somewhere. Also, I worked late sometimes to make sure I was actually working the number of hours I should, but I didn't cut it so fine for the train, and I didn't do it most days anymore. Revenge of the Highway Construction Boss First things first, this is a story that an old friend slash coworker of mine told me years ago. This friend has since passed, RIP Greg, so I am unable to go back to him to get more details. Greg's family lived near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Greg's dad was in construction working as a job site foreman and Calgary was going through an oil boom in the 1980s and new roads and highways needed to be built. The practice at the time, probably still is, was to get expensive surveyors to lay out the path for the road at the start of the project and the path was marked by wooden stakes in the ground. These roads were going through some of the grasslands on Calgary's outskirts and good progress was being made on the road in question. Then one morning, the crew got to the job site and found out that all of the stakes had been knocked over. Calgary had, maybe still has, its fair share of yahoos and pickup trucks who like to cause trouble, so from tire tracks, they figure that during the night, someone had found the job site, noticed the stakes, and decided it would be fun to drive over all of them. I suppose today's yahoos and pickups would be deterred by cheaper surveillance cameras, but this was about 30 to 35 years ago. Greg's dad was fuming, but he had to call the surveyors back in to do the layout again before they could continue. A few nights later, the same thing happened again. They arrived at the site, found all of the stakes knocked out again. Another call to the surveyor's office later, they had the road mapped again, but Greg's dad had a plan. 
Construction sites can have a lot of rebar and other types of iron and other metals lying around. They also have lots of heavy equipment for applying force to things. After the stakes were mapped out for the third time, Greg's dad got a crew together to drive an eight foot long piece of iron vertically into the ground directly behind one of the stakes near the end of the road layout with the top of the iron in line with the top of the stakes. Then he waited. A small number of days later, he got to the job site and found a wrecked pickup truck in the field along the road's path. Its oil pan and other undercarriage components had been ripped off by the metal post that was protruding from the ground. They had signs all around the site indicating that unauthorized vehicles were prohibited. Entering was at your own risk, so they were covered from a legal standpoint. With the truck as evidence, they were able to find its owner and have him charged with trespassing, destruction of property, mischief, and anything else that they could make stick. I have a long lost sister? So this story was around two years ago, back when I was 17. I had my own tennis clothing and equipment business. Till my 18th birthday, my dad owned the business as well. We were shared partners, but I mostly ran the shop by myself, which means the opening times were quite weird. It was open Monday to Friday from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Sometimes I would open it later due to the train connections from my main workplace to the tennis club. And on Saturdays, it was open from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. midday and from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. due to me still wanting at least some free time. Now on this day, my train ran a bit late, so I was rushing to open up my shop. It was a Friday and usually one of the more hectic and busier days. Many students of my dad and members of the club wanted to check out the new batch of tennis rackets and clothes that we got from the firm we worked closely with and wanted to try them out. Most of them were very understanding though and I knew them all by name, at least most of them. After opening up shop, letting them in and having them look around and helping out wherever I could, I went to this one lady and her kid who I had never seen in the club or the shop. We shall name the mother Tanya due to me knowing more entitled Tanya's than Karen's. The conversation went like this. Me. Hi, how may I help you, ma'am? Tanya. Why didn't you help me before? Where were you at 5 p.m.? God, no one can do anything correctly here. And letting someone so young here serve, they should be ashamed. I was personally very confused, and a few other customers were as well, since they knew I might have a panic attack and that I was the son of the coach here. Me. Ah... Uh, I'm very sorry, ma'am. I couldn't be here earlier due to Tanya. I don't want to listen to your poor excuses. Give me one of those rackets and give me a 50% discount. I looked up at where she was pointing, trying to calm myself down from this stressful situation. She was pointing at the most expensive and newest racket we just got today. I then looked at the kid who couldn't have been older than 10. Me. Ma'am, is this for you or for your daughter? My daughter, of course. Just give me the racket so I can leave. I know the owner since I'm his daughter. I was very well confused at that point since, well, I didn't know I had another sister who was around 30 years older than me. Me. Ma'am, I'm asking because I need the correct hand size for the grip and weight. I tried to explain due to it being a major problem for giving people a tennis arm, which basically means pulling a muscle, straining your wrist too much, and just being in pain. I go crouch down and politely ask the girl to put her hand against mine to see the size, asking her age and how long she's been playing. All of the normal questions if you go to a good sports store. Tanya, who was next to us, started rolling her eyes and making clicking noises with her mouth and other noises that indicated she was being impatient. The next thing I knew though, she was grabbing my hair and pulling me up. Tanya, just give me the racket. This should be free due to me being the daughter. I saw my opportunity and knew I couldn't wait any longer. The others in the store were looking at us quietly and smirking slightly. I nod my head and go to the back door, which leads right to the tennis court where my dad is. Me. Dad, your lost daughter turned up. I yelled. He looked at me confused, but I made some eye movements, indicating we had a weird lady in the store. He nodded and went in. Dad. So, you're my long lost daughter. I didn't know I got my old classmate pregnant back when I was in school. That's when everyone started laughing. Me. Yeah, Dad. Didn't know I had a sister. When did you want to tell me that I had an older sister? Dad. To be honest, I didn't even know I had a girlfriend at the time. The woman's look on her face was priceless. It went from confused to angry to very embarrassed, all whilst everyone in the store and her daughter were laughing. 
She huffed and stormed out of the store, basically dragging her kid behind her. Since then, I've never seen her. Note, I met up with a few other business owners in the area and they all had this same lady come in apparently. But a certain fact is that most tennis stores in the area, or in any club I think, is owned by the tennis coach who never has an employee. So basically, you can't try that with us. Am I the jerk for not making coffee how my fiancé wants it? Weird title, I, 23, female, no. But this has been a point of contention for a while. My fiancé, 25, male, is a foodie and is extremely particular about a few things, one of them being his coffee. We use a manual grinder, get distilled water. The water in our area is really hard and according to him affects the taste, but I don't notice anything. And we have an AeroPress and a metal coffee filter to make the coffee. I'm very much not a foodie, unless being a Sour Patch Kids connoisseur is a thing. My fiancé weighs his coffee beans to make sure that he's using the exact right amount, changes the setting on the coffee grinder depending on whether he's using the AeroPress or the metal coffee filter, measures the water, and if he's using the AeroPress, lets the coffee grounds and water brew for a certain amount of time before actually making the coffee. On the other hand, I use a scoop to measure my coffee beans, use whatever setting the grinder is on, we'll usually just use tap water, eyeball the water instead of measuring it, and don't let it sit to brew. And you know what? It's fine. It tastes fine. It makes me happy. The end. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Problem is that this really bothers my fiance. We've had multiple arguments about me making my coffee wrong and it's very normal for him to badger me to weigh my coffee beans or switch the coffee grinder to the optimal setting while I'm making my coffee. If I'm making coffee for him, sure, I'll measure the beans and all of that jazz because I know that he can taste the difference. But I don't think that I should have to jump through all of these hoops for something that doesn't affect him. On the other hand, he seems to be really bothered by this. Today, as I was trying to scoop coffee beans into the grinder, he reached around me to put the scale he uses in front of me and asked me to please weigh my coffee beans. I was really frustrated because we've had this conversation so many times, so I snapped the word no at him, and he walked away and muttered, you too, saying that even though I hadn't said it, I'd definitely been thinking, forget you. For the record, I wasn't even thinking that. So, am I the jerk for not making coffee how my fiancé thinks I should, and for sometimes snapping at him when he gets pushy about it? Edit. I don't know if this is important, but I drink decaf and he drinks regular, so I'm never making coffee for both of us. I'm either making coffee for him or I'm making coffee for myself. Edit 2. I sat him down and told him that I needed him to never comment on how I make my coffee and how I was making it. He repeated it back to me in his own words to check that he understood me. A counselor once told me that this is helpful to do in an argument, and then he agreed. Am I the jerk for leaving my friend's girlfriend stranded in another city? Last week, I got a call from a friend asking me to drive her girlfriend into a major city in my country. He asked me because he knows I enjoy driving and I don't get nervous in packed traffic. Plus, the girlfriend barely drives and hates going into the city as there are lots of restricted streets and such. I told my friend my plan was reading a book that weekend, so he insisted a bit further saying I was doing him a huge favor since he was out for the weekend and that girlfriend would use her car so I didn't have to put unnecessary kilometers on mine. After telling him I was just doing it because he asked and that I had nothing to do inside the city, I finally agreed. Q Saturday. I go pick up his girlfriend early in the morning. We grab her car and I see it has only a half a tank of gas. Enough to get us there but not enough for a round trip. She acknowledges it and tells me we'll fill up in the city whatever. During the three-hour trip, she kept complaining I was going too slow and that she was going to miss an important appointment. I was going the speed limit the whole time. Once we got to the city, we parked in a prepay and she asked me to pay since she didn't bring any cash. Whatever. I wanted to go to a park and read while she was busy, but I had to run errands with her because she didn't feel safe in the city center on a sunny day. Whatever. She even got mad because I asked her to make a quick trip to the car to leave some bags because I didn't want to carry them and she told me her boyfriend always carried these bags and it was faster. I started to get annoyed here and I told her no. Once she got done with all she had to do, we went back to the car. Before I got in, she mentioned I still hadn't given her the money. When I asked her what she meant, she said I had to pay for half of the tank as I had gone with her. 
I got mad and said I was doing my friend a favor and I wasted my day just for her to buy random crap. I wasn't paying. She said something like, either pay or you don't get into the car. I stormed off, tired and angry while she shouted something like, yeah, yeah, you'll come back. I didn't. I got a train ticket and spent some four and a half hours to go home while my phone was burning up with calls and messages. I turned it off. I got home and the next day my friend called asking what happened. Apparently some poor soul had to go pick her up because she wasn't driving home. I told him and he said that girlfriend can be difficult at times but I pulled a massive jerk move leaving her alone there at sundown. So am I the jerk? Well what do you think? Is OP the jerk or was the girlfriend? Please let us know. I would have left her there too. She sounds like a Kevin Jr. to be honest. Please come watch this video next, you won't believe what happens. Join as a channel member today and we'll give you a special shout out in our next video. And to have us make any kind of video you'd like us to, head over to our Fiverr, link pinned in the comments below.